dramatic renunciation of his British birthright. He proclaimed himself King of Ireland. He stole money from a woman. Drug addiction and orgies, black magic and treachery, these are the ingredients of the myth of Alistair Crowley. A myth which has grown with the years until most people are convinced that Crowley was in truth the wickedest man in the world. But he didn't seem so to Madeleine Montalban, who met him about 1933 in a fashionable Chelsea salon. There was Leslie Hutchinson playing the piano, and in came Alistair Crowley. And my first feeling was one of great disappointment. This, the wickedest man in the world, looked to me like a bishop. Lord Bradwell, better known as the MP Tom Dryberg, also knew Crowley, and he too has his doubts about the popular image. It's very difficult to say. It would be a little unfair to judge him posthumously and say he was a complete charlatan. I don't think he was a complete charlatan. And I don't dismiss him as a total fraud. I don't think he was. Edward Alexander Crowley, the Alistair came later, was born in Leamington Spa in October 1875. His father was rich, he was a leading member of the family which brewed Crowley's ales, and he was a deeply religious member of the exclusive Plymouth Brethren. Alistair was devoted to his father, and in imitation of him was pious to an extraordinary degree. Then, when he was twelve, his father died, leaving the boy in sole charge of his mother, who he'd always detested. Suddenly, everything altered. He was being educated at a school for the Sons of Brethren in Cambridge, and before his father's death, he had accepted the atmosphere of this Puritan do the boys hall. Now the scales dropped from his eyes, and he experienced the full horror of what he was later to call a boyhood in hell. A boy named Glasgow, with insane taint, told Mr. Champney that he had visited me, twelve years old, at my mother's house during the holidays. True so far, he had and found me lying drunk at the bottom of the stairs. My mother was never asked about this, nor was I told of it. I was put into Coventry. That is, no master nor boy might speak to me or I to them. I was fed on bread and water. During play hours, I worked in the schoolroom. During work hours, I walked solitary round and round the playground. I was expected to confess the crime of which I was not only innocent, but unaccused. This punishment went on for a term and a half. I was at last threatened with expulsion for my refusal to confess. And so dreadful a picture of the horrors of expulsion did they paint me. The guilty wretch, shunned by his fellows, slinks on through life to a dishonoured grave, etc. That I actually chose to endure my tortures and to thank my oppressor. Yes, they all walked very close to Jesus as close as Judas did. Through the good sense of an uncle, Crowley was taken away from this school. He had by now concluded that if Christians behaved in the manner of the Plymouth Brethren, then he was on the other side. He spent much time deciding on a suitable sin to demonstrate where his loyalties lay. Eventually, in his early teens, he made love to his mother's maid on her bed during family prayers. He was then betrayed to Mrs. Crowley, who exclaimed in horror that her son must be the beast, whose number is 666, which is mentioned in the book of Revelations. Ever afterwards, Crowley believed that in some unspecified sense, he was that beast. His education continued in fits and starts, and amongst other things, he became an accomplished mountaineer. In October 1895, he arrived at Trinity College, Cambridge, he had passed the entrance examination with lackadaisical brilliance, but took little interest in his set work. The only man in the university who could beat him at chess was the amateur champion of England. Alistair Crowley, with a growing reputation as an intrepid mountaineer, was something of a swell. So he began to behave like one. He wore elegant suits, with rings jingling on his fingers, large floppy bow ties about his neck, and had numerous affairs. But he also discovered literature. He had been an instinctive writer of verse from early childhood, and till the end of his days he considered himself a serious poet. At home, regulations had forbidden practically everything except the Bible. At Cambridge, he at last discovered a poetic style, the swinging rhythms of the contemporary master Swinburne, which had turned the heads of all fashionable undergraduates and pervade Crowley's own reading of his 1907 poem, The Pentagram. 
In the years of the primal force, in the dawn of terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse, and man was the lord of the earth. He made him in hollow skin from the heart of an holy tree. He compassed the earth therein, and man was the lord of the sea. He controlled the vigorous steam. He harnessed the lightning for hire. He drove the celestial team, and man was the lord of the fire. Deep mouth from their thrones deep seated. The choirs of the eons declare the last of the demons defeated. For man is the lord of the air. Arise, O man, in thy strength. The kingdom is thine to inherit. Till the high gods witness at length that man is the lord of his spirit. But such confidence came later. At Cambridge, Crowley had no idea of how he should master his spirit, but already he wanted to. For with freedom had come insecurity. He was also an out-and-out -out romantic. In the 1890s, occultism was enjoying one of its periodic vogues, and it was a virtual certainty that Crowley's romantic temperament would lead him to the magicians. In the summer of 1898, he went climbing in the Alps and met an analytical chemist called Julian Baker who surprised him by talking knowledgeably about alchemy. Baker offered to introduce Crowley to another rock artist, who turned out to be a member of a magical organization called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. This showed every sign of being just that society of initiates Crowley had been looking for. He gave up his ambitions of entering the diplomatic service, left Cambridge without a degree, and moved to London. He had decided to become a magician. Richard Cavendish, author of The Black Arts, The Powers of Darkness, and an authority on the occult, explains what this entails. What I think Crowley himself was essentially trying to do was what is really the whole tradition of high magic to do. That is to make yourself God, virtually. To achieve so consummate an understanding and mastery of yourself and everything around you that you become divine. Magic depends or is thought to depend very heavily on a combination of imagination and willpower. And what you have to do is to summon up your own emotions, really, in the strongest possible form, and then concentrate them and direct them at your objective. The magical theory is that the universe and God are man on a gigantic scale, that man is a sort of little miniature model of the universe and of God. And therefore, if a man can expand himself mystically and magically sufficiently, he can become the universe and God. He can become everything. This means that his, that his consciousness is unified and that everything that exists is part of his consciousness. It is a titanic attempt to achieve supreme power and an attempt which I would have thought always inevitably bound to fail. Although the Golden Dawn was supposed to be based on instructions emanating from some mysterious secret chiefs, it had, in fact, been founded about 1888. Crowley was not impressed by most of his fellow members, who included the poet W.B. Yeats and the actress Florence Farr. But there was Alan Bennett, a chemist some four years older than Crowley. Bennett was greatly respected as a magician, and frightening stories were told of him. Crowley at once decided that here was the master he had been looking for. The basic methods used by the Golden Dawn consisted of a sequence of lectures and prescribed magical exercises using robes, wands, pentacles, and all the apparatus of traditional magic. To mark his spiritual progress, the initiate passed through a series of grades, like a candidate in Freemasonry. Crowley showed remarkable ability and shot through his grades with extraordinary speed. 